speaker for the day, somebody you've been waiting for. A man whose colorful life has taken him from IIT Bombay to MIT to Cornell to the sets of films like Kayamat Se Kayamat Tak and Jo Jeeta Wahi Sikandar, Mansoor Ali Khan has found his calling in Kunur, in living sustainably on his cheese-making farm, Acres Wild. We've had an inspiring day with joy and happiness and optimism, but is the future really that bright? For a dose of insightful realism, Mansoor Ali Khan. The good news is that I'm the last speaker. <laughs> the bad news is I'm going to speak forever. Till I convince you. Okay. Um, see, I'm glad I'm the last speaker because I know what everybody has said. And uh, the, the kind of forum that TED is, it, it, it sparks your imagination. It, it forces you to think. And generally, even if you're talking about negative things, you're talking about positivity. Now, I'm going to be talking about something. I want to ask how many of you are optimists here? Okay, all the optimists can go out. <laughs> uh, how many of you are pessimists? And how many of you are realists? You can't be both. <laughs> you can't be all three. Okay, so that is the domain in which I'm talking. I'm not talking about what we should do. It's not about morality. It's not about uh, creativity. It's not about uh, our values. It's got nothing to do with anything like that, which a lot of you all were talking about. I'm only talking about what is possible. So for, for a minute, kindly switch that in your mind. I'm only going to be talking about what is possible with no value judgment attached to it. Okay, just keep that in mind. Oops, this thing has started on its own. Yeah, sorry. And one other word I want you to keep in mind is limits. Okay, because we've been hearing about how we can break limits of all kinds, of our achievement, of this, of that. In today's age, breaking limits is really celebrated. Okay, and I'm going to be talking a little bit from the other point of view. I'm going to be talking about respecting limits, or at least recognizing them. So my lecture is called... Um, can you see what's happening here? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, okay. But from here, I can't see anything because of this light here. So it's called the third curve. So obviously, there's a first curve and there's a second curve. There are two curves before this. And that is the topic of my lecture. The end of economics, but as we know it. Okay? In the manner in which we understand it. So what is economics to any of you? What is it about? Just one word. Money. More than money. Well, it's about growth. Okay, so we'll just keep that in the back of our heads that when we think of economics today, modern economics, we're always talking about growth. If growth stops, we start crying. We blame the finance minister. We sack him. So he starts crying. That's what economics means to us, actually. So let's backtrack. I'm not telling you what I think about that, but let's go back a bit. We have a mind and we have a body. The mind comes up with a concept and the body has to actually execute that concept in reality. Okay? So for instance, the mind says, I want to pick up this glass and the body can pick up the glass. Then the mind says, I want to pick up this chair. And the body can do that. Then the mind says, why not pick up this car? Your body cannot. So there is a limit to bodies, but there is no limits to minds. We celebrate that. We should, but we have to be careful because we are talking about quantity, not quality. Okay? So when it comes to quantity, we have to be very careful about limits. We are not talking about how much your parents love you. We're not talking about how loyal you are to your friends. We're not talking about how faithful you are to your country. That's quality. We are talking about quantity. And bodies have limits. Okay, let's take another example of growth. Remember, mind and body. Mind comes with concept, body has reality. Here's the father, rather tough looking guy. And he has a little daughter. And he says, his concept is that my daughter is going to grow taller every year. 
so she grows taller she grows taller he stretches her she grows taller he gives her steroids she goes taller <laughs> and she goes out of the frame <laughs> now he says this is going to happen forever is that possible why not because she's she's a body okay and he's got a mind his mind can say anything doesn't mean she has to live up to it he's going to kill her by giving her steroids so the question is can anything grow forever no i'm talking about quantity mind you any quantity well we do have one because you know we are very smart so we have one concept which comes from our mind and we call it money and we say money is a representation of value okay and this must grow at p percent every year which we call interest so if you have 1 lakh and you say 7 percent interest then you get a line that goes like this you keep adding 7000 every year that's time on the you you guys are going to see a, a few graphs in this talk please bear with me but i'll I, i'll try and make it as uh, clear as possible so that's time that's money and it goes plus 7000 plus 7000 plus 7000 every year and it goes up p percent per year so that is your money growth now this is if come from our mind then our mind says wait a minute that growth is not good enough for us let's compound that let's add the 7000 at the end of the year and now let's charge seven let's get interest on that what happens to your curve it becomes exponential it looks like this that's very different from the other kind of growth that we saw and then we say wait a minute this must happen forever this is how we define money in our system mind you the whole world defines it that way this is what you get it's a monster this growth must compound it must happen forever is this possible and why do we accept it but we'll come to that because economists said yes it's possible so we listen to ex experts we stopped using our minds we stopped using our sensibilities and we surrender to experts but we are we are partly to blame but anyway the economists say yes so how do they say yes they say just remember one thing these concepts these ideas are great things now i'm contesting what this forum is about ideas are great but you have to also be wary of ideas we can have what we just defined is an onion of ideas this is an onion the inner onion says money is value the second ring of the onion you must have opened an onion at some point and you know it's made of layers and you had interest then you compound it and you do it perpetually so you have perpetual exponential quantitative growth and this money onion is fabulous now just before i can say anything the economist tells me trust the onion and before i can say anything he says watch watch your money grow put 10 lakhs at 7% interest becomes 20 lakhs in 10 years if it was not it would be only it would take 14 years and every 14 years it would double not 10 so it becomes 20 lakhs in 10 years i'm very excited becomes 40 lakhs in 20 years starting slow nothing great in 10 decades it becomes 100 crores that means my kids never have to work and their kids never have to work and they just have to wait one decade more and becomes 200 crores and you wait one decade more it becomes 400 crores what is the problem so it increases a thousand let's not go that far let's not get too greedy <laughs> let's just let, let's stick with 100 crores is enough for me um in case any of you have 10 lakh spare you can give it to me i'll give you 50 crores back so it increases a thousand 24 times in within your child's life wow i trust the onion i mean this is how he's convinced me now since you're laughing you trust the onion also <laughs> they all trust the onion we all trust the onion this is the state of the world today we trust growth we worship growth the gentleman before me talked about that temple which was meant for other things it became a place of worship for something completely else and this is what this money which was meant to be a mode of exchange that you give me something i give you a token of exchange became into a monster okay so it was it had its own place 
but who remembers that who remembers what the temple was for same way so we trust the Adyan but you know when that economist left I had a big butt in my mind I said if money grows a thousand twenty four times so does the use of energy and resources because you don't make money out of money that's printing money you don't print money you make money which is a product of some goods which you have made or a service that you have done and any goods or service takes resources and energy and this has been proven that money growth and energy and resource growth go in sync so I will not go into that otherwise it will become a different lecture but you have to take my word for that you have to take my word that that is true so we come to the body reality if it takes that much resources if the if the energy and resources needed to make our money grow from 10 lakhs to 100 crores a thousand twenty four times within 10 decades then so does the and where does all that come from where does the energy and where do the resources to do all this come from I know only one place it all comes from the body of the earth and the earth is a body Today when people were talking about environmental issues and when they were talking about connectivity and when they were saying it's an extension, it's community, it's this and so many things, we were saying it in so many different ways. We have to recognize and today the world has recognized and realized that what the people of, of your used to say is that the earth is a living organism. The earth is a living body. It is a body. It is not a place where you dig and you just take out as much copper as you want and just take out as much iron as you want. We do that but you have to remember it's a body even if you are not willing to believe that it's living it is limited at least you will grant me that whether you accept that the earth is living or not it is limited and the laws that the body of the earth follow are called the laws of geology now we haven't made the laws of geology we made the laws for money right but the earth has its own mind and the earth behaves like this this is the second curve you remember I said we have two curves before we go to the third curve the first curve you remember seeing here the red curve that went to the sky with no respect for limits the earth has respect for limits this is a bell curve but you know the most surprising thing that I have found in all our education system and we spoke so much about education systems here is that there isn't a single part of our education system that makes you aware that the earth behaves in a bell system bell curve there is not a single part of our education I have tested this all over India I have been to institutes in India and I, have, I won't take any names but people who ought to be knowing how the earth behaves because they're, they are connected with energy and resources that institute but when I asked them this question they didn't know and I said well the earth behaves in a bell curve now don't confuse this with the grades you know middle is C B A that is statistical distribution that is also but that's the reason why the bell curve is called the normal distribution curve because it is normal that's how things in, in, in reality work. It's a reality curve. That is why I call it the reality curve. So we had the mind curve, the concept curve, and we have the body curve, the reality curve. Okay? And there's one thing which should strike you straight away about the reality curve is that it has a peak in the middle. That means when you finish half of that resource, just half, it starts going down. It doesn't behave like this. It's not like a petrol tank. If you're driving from here to uh, Kunur and your tank is full and you go half the way and your tank is half full, you don't worry because the second half will take you the second distance. But that doesn't work with this. Nobody tells us this. Why not? We talk about conservation. We talk about sustainability. We talk about the environment. We talk about money. We talk about saving. We talk about, uh, you know, charity. But nobody tells us that this is how the earth behaves. And this is the, this is the second curve. And everything that you get from the earth, especially the ones that you dig, geology, remember, follows this curve. Iron, copper, coal, and particularly oil. So I'm going to be talking in the context of oil because oil is our economic reality. Now that's another subject, I won't go into that, but oil is what makes. And oil peaked in 2005. This is 2005 here, okay? Just keep that in the back of your head. Let's go further. So here are the two curves. My God, they look quite different. I want money to grow like this, but the thing that makes money grow, which is oil and everything else, goes like that. 
I'm going to be in trouble. We are going to be in trouble. Just look at the two curves. Well, one was made by economists and one was made by God. Who's going to win? You said it. <laughs> so let's put them together. Let's put, let's, let's, let's pitch. I'm sorry, I don't have anything against economists because we've accepted it. But I'm just saying that economists keep reminding us that that is the way to go. Okay? And, uh, and all of us have bought into that belief. So it's nothing against them. It's just that today you can't say anything because economics is the prime mode of thought. If you want to do some good work on charity, somebody will say, but how, what are you getting out of it? Nothing. Then you're a fool. I've got a lack of rupees. I put it under my pillow. What? No interest. You're a fool. So this has become a status quo of thinking that money has to grow. It has to compound. It has to happen perpetually. So we have bought into this. So here's the, shall I say, man-made curve. And here's the God-made curve. Now this is the beginning of time. Then This is the beginning from when we started using oil, okay? There are three phases. One, up to where the two curves are more or less the same. So obviously this is one kind of phase. Then they start going apart. That is the second phase. But at least they're going in the same direction. But after this point, this goes there, that goes there. So that is the third phase. Let's see what it means. That's point one, that's point two. Sorry, I forgot to do that. So in phase one, which was from 1850 when oil started seriously being used, our economic growth just shot up exponentially. If you look at the history of money over the last five centuries, it's like this. And then 1850, it starts going like this. And then it starts shooting up because oil made it possible. Everything. I want you guys, there's something which, some things which you have to go back home and think. It cannot be fit in a lecture. Just go back and see what oil means or fossil fuels mean in our lives and you'll be stunned. It has not only got to do with your cars or, or, or moving the plane or, or stuff like that, but plastics, lubricants, bitumen, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals. These are byproducts of oil and only those things made this kind of growth possible. So we celebrated it. We call them paradise times. We call, I call it paradise times because you could imagine anything. Spin satellites, send man to the moon, make you know, uh, cars bigger, have planes going uh, intercontinental and everything was fine. We still do it. But there was no problem, there was no problem on the horizon. Everything was fine until we came to point one. And this was somewhere in the 60s. 69 men landed on the moon. And that was like the ultimate achievement. Man thought we are going to now. I remember I was in school and I thought, wow, I'm going to live in space. And I'm going to live on the moon. I used to look at those drawings and I used to say, wow, what a feeling to go across this landscape and stuff. We are nowhere. It's going to be impossible for man to go back to the moon again. There's a reason for that. So that's phase one. Paradise times. As we went along, yeah, sorry. So in this phase, we were actually producing value. The money which was being generated by the, by the resources wa was actual in value because we were actually producing something. And the production was equivalent to the money. Money had actual value. So the growth of money, which we were trying to, because the whole exercise was growth of money, was real. This growth of money in the first phase was real. That money was actually worth that. But when the two curves start parting, like this, from the 60s onwards, late 60s onwards, nobody noticed it. Do you know what we noticed? We noticed that the whale had disappeared. We noticed the polar bear was disappearing. We noticed that the, the rainforests were disappearing. We noticed that the rivers were drying. That was the effect on the body. This is the body. This is the mind. So there was another effect happening on the body. Like the poor child whose father was giving her steroids to grow faster. That's what do you think would happen to her body? Something or the other. Nothing very good. So these things we called it eco collapse. Something else. Nothing to do with money. If we make more money, we can solve this eco collapse. So we go ahead and make more money and cause more eco collapse. And the two curves parted. But the people who defined money and all of us, because if I had money in the bank, I would go and I do. And I'll go and pick my brains of my banker if he doesn't give me the interest. So how does he do it? I come back to the money onion. The money onion is the magic thing, as the economist told us. You know why did he say that? 
He said it because, he said when you are in trouble, just add another concept. So we added the concept of shares. Now shares has two things. One is the dividend that the share gives you and one is the price of the share. The dividend is real, the price is conceived or so rather perceived. I think that the share of your company is worth 500 rupees. She thinks it's worth 1000. She says, oh my God, she says 1000, let me buy it for 1200. He says, it's a perceived value. You're going into the casino model. That was the beginning of the casino model. It had nothing to do with productivity. XYZ company had not produced anything more, but their shares were going up. So buy it. So money growth was going on. So we added shares as one more ring to the money onion. But it kept going higher. The money needed to grow further. So we said, let's have fractional reserve banking, which means your bank is supposed to keep 90% of its money and only lend 10%. Remember, banks earn by lending. Banks can only earn by lending. Now, they can't lend only 10% because they're in trouble. Look at where the money curve is going. So they have to lend more. So they say, oh, let's lend, lend 20%. Why not 30? The other bank says, hey, how about 40? The more you're lending, you're increasing the risk. But you're making money grow. Again, you added one more. So what you did was you removed the roof. You have a plant growing. Instead of trimming the plant, you say, let's, let's remove the roof. And that's exactly what we did in the next phase. We removed the gold standard. Gold was supposed to be a measure of, of some kind. On the, on the notes earlier in America, they used to have that you will, you, I can actually go in and cash it and get that amount of gold. They removed that. Now it, just, it was just a fiat currency. It had nothing to do with any gold or any standard. Why did we remove the gold standard? Because of the ceiling. Money has to grow. That tree has to keep growing. We worship that tree and that tree grows exponentially. So either you do something about the tree or you remove the roof and get wet. But that's what we did. We removed that. That was another layer added to. So the money onion is a brilliant thing. I do agree with the economists that money onion is fantastic. Because all it takes from your mind, which is why I'm very wary of ideas, there has to be a sense of ethics. There has to be a much deeper understanding of ideas than just say that's a concept. So we were adding concepts merrily. Shares, fractional reserve banking, no gold standard. And then we said, then, you know, I, I forgot to tell you one thing about this curve. You remember how it reaches 100 crores? As you keep moving this way, it goes very fast. The next time it doubles. You can't do anything about it. Next time it doubles from 100 to 200 crores, 200 to 400 crores. Now you are in real trouble. You needed something really extraordinary to keep money growing. No problem. Man's brain is, mind is ingenious. He can come up with anything. And so we came up with leveraging, options, black shoulder derivative, hedge funds, financial instruments. These were only mathematical ways of trying to cheat statistics, to trying to cheat reality. It was a casino model. I'm in a casino. We've turned everything into a casino. I might as well go to Goa and bet there, you know. Our financial system wasn't supposed to be that. But why did it turn into a casino? Because this growth was false. We added only perceived value. This value was only in our minds. It was only on the paper. It was only on the certificate which was given to you. Real productivity stopped here. And this, this was the only way we could do it, which was conceptual. Why did we all buy it? Because this curve was still going up. The resources were still available. The oil was still available. So it was kind of real. Things were still happening. At least they were going in the same direction. But then, so the growth of money was false. That huge, put, uh, by the way, this is not here. It's somewhere there. That huge difference was false. And in 2005, world oil peaked. Now this is another thing which nobody tells you. That world oil, and we were talking about it, people who are realists. You remember I said optimist, pessimist. I'm a realist. I stand in the middle. I don't believe we're all going to die. But I don't believe that, that we can imagine that you know, money can gr grow exponentially. When oil peaked, which is what the realists were talking about, and it reached $146 a barrel, that just went to show how important oil is to run our industrial world. Everything runs on it. There's no alternative for it. We had this. Within a few months, the world almost came to a standstill. Within a few hours, sorry, it would have come to a standstill. It was bailed out. It was falsely. 
50 trillion dollars got wiped out within a few months. The, where were those 50 trillion dollars? They were here. Later on, the economist said, well, you know, they were, this was just perceived wealth and all. But what was it before? Why did you ask me to invest in it? Why did we have a scheme like this? 50 trillion dollars just boom. And that's not all. Actually, it's a lot more. It's just that it got bailed out, it got corrected and everything, and the governments bailed the banks and all that. It, it, in a way, it saved economics. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that's the end of it. We have reached peak oil. That means we've reached the end of the second phase. Now you can only get less resources. You can try what you want. What is happening today? Look around you. The US housing mortgage crisis. It was the, the, the whole scheme was to, print, to make money happen. The euro crisis. The high food prices. The invasion of various countries for oil. It is, it is very, very direct. And oil is not, we are in a second recession. But oil prices haven't come down below $100 a barrel. If we are in a second recession, you would have expected oil prices to have crashed to $20 a barrel. It just goes to show that you're on the downside of the curve already. When we went up, growth was possible. So we believed in growth. In the middle, which is here to here, it was false growth in our minds. And now we have to prepare for shrinkage. This is what I wanted to actually communicate to you. The, our future is considerably different. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. But if you imagine that I'm talking globally, okay, India is getting a certain amount of growth, but globally, we are going to experience shrinkage. The laws of economics have already inverted. In other countries, they've already inverted. What goes up must come down. There is a limit to things. When you're 35, you, ru you start running slower than before 35. Whoever said that you can run faster at 60, uh, like when you were 16? So, that is the growth I'm talking about. And that growth is going to translate into shrinkage. You're already seeing it happening. But the problem that is, that is there is that everybody is talking about it as if it's a temporary thing. We've seen this before. We've seen recessions before. We've seen this before. It's just a repeat of the past. History repeats itself and stuff. History surely repeats itself, but this one thing will never repeat itself. Because we lived outside our budget. There was a certain budget, and that's where we come to the third curve. For millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, this was our budget. This is the sun's energy. In the nighttime, it's low. Daytime, it's high. Winter, it's low. Su summer, it's high. When the earth is closer to the sun, it's more. When the earth is away from the sun, it's, 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 it's low. And this we used to move but in a narrow band of energy. All life evolved like this. All ecology evolved like this. In this phase. That is the third, what I call the third curve. There's another way to look at the third curve. Each living thing has a third curve. Your body has its own third curve. You cannot pump your body with more, more energy. It has to move only in that narrow band. An ant has a third curve. An antelope has a third curve. A leopard has a third curve. And the earth has a third curve. So the first curve, mind curve, exponential. Second curve, bell curve. Third curve is the curve which goes on like this. What did we do? The 250 million year of years of sunlight which were accumulated we decided to burn it. And we said how smart we are. How wonderful we are. Look at this. Planes, trains, this, that, the other, satellites, moon. But global warming, forests gone, rivers dried, population explosion, which is directly connected to surplus food. And we reached the peak. What we are in denial about today. Okay, we made a mistake. That's the past. But what are we in denial? Our denial is that no, this can keep going. This model can keep going. And that is the denial that we are facing today. And everybody out there, all the people in the mainstream, are not letting you know that this model is already over. They're just talking about perpetuating growth. Read the newspaper tomorrow. Finance minister promises that he'll get the growth back. Obama says, I'm going to get growth back. So, and so whoever is the leader, that's their job. But is it the truth? Is it possible to get growth back? 250 million years of sunlight burnt. We burnt half of it from here to here. What does that mean in terms of salary? If you're earning 10,000 bucks, what does it mean? How much are you spending per month? 10,000 times more. Can you live that way? Is that economics? And how is this economics? So we were living in a false economics. Now, we have two ways down. If we deny it, we come 
swiftly bouncing down to the third curve. What does denial mean? We say, oh, we're going to run the same systems. All we'll do is put some solar panels. We'll put some windmills. We'll just grow some uh, uh, sugar cane and, you know, get biofuels out of it. Oh, we'll just, uh, you know, that denial is actually taking you more of your energy than, than it is giving you. So you'll come bouncing down. If we do it sensibly with acceptance, then we call it a transition. It's like landing a, a 747 with three engines gone. Either saying that I'm going to keep flying higher, I'm going to keep flying higher. Or you say, I've got one engine, I'm coming down. Okay, so nobody's going to get the, none of the passengers will even notice what's happening. So two paths down. I'm not saying there aren't other paths, but these are the two extreme paths. But whichever way you look at it, you remember I told you this talk is about possibility, not morality. I have not called anyone, uh, I have not accused anybody of anything, except economists. But, <laughs> but I mean, who else can I put the blame on? Um, either way, we have to come down to the third curve. The third curve is the end of the economics, and that's as we know it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.